All right. Okay. I'd just like to welcome everybody who is on this evening, give a short intro and um, just share a little bit with what's happening and what are the purpose of these next 10 weeks of going live um, and on YouTube, whatever, is to help people to understand and how to engage in the realms of the heavenlies and what it means to engage in the realms of the heavenlies. I know a lot of the terminology we've been using and we get to might confuse some people. But I'd like to just share a little bit uh, quickly this evening on the grace of God and the resurrection Passover weekend, which we are presently in. A lot of people have, are under the false impression that Jesus was crucified on a Friday. He was actually crucified on a Thursday because it was a double Passover. It was a double Sabbath. It was the Jewish Passover, the Pesach. So that meant on the Thursday evening before sunset, he had to be in the grave and Friday starts at sunset Thursday and because the Jewish day starts at sunset, not sunrise. And so when the first star was seen in the skies and the last star um, and the sunset, at sunset, the first star was seen, that is when the day starts according to the Jewish calendar. So for those of you who don't realize it, if he rose on the Sunday, he had to have been crucified on the Thursday before sunset. That's just some information that you might like to know. Um, and it's through that completed work on the cross that he has done for us and the grace that he has given us to become sons of God. And what it really entails, being a son of God, is one of the things through the, the completed work of the cross, he has given us the ability and the faith to enter into the rest of abiding in Christ. I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures out of the biblical background, just so that you can know that where we're coming from. Hebrews 11 verses 1. Um, through to 6, Hebrews 4, verses 1 to 14, Colossians 3, verses 1 to 4, Romans 8, the whole chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 58, um, are all related to being sons and being in that place of rest. If we look at those scriptures, one of the scriptures that I meditated on for almost seven years was Colossians 3 verses 1 to 4, where Paul speaking, he says, if then you've died, and that's the key to the resurrected life of living in Christ, is having died. If you've died, it's no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in you, and you live in him. And... Um, We will, in a little while, also give anybody a chance to sort of ask questions and engage. But I just want to, I'm just briefly sharing a bit of background and a bit of info. Um, if you look at Hebrews 4, verses 1 through to 6, specifically verse 3, for we who have believed do enter that rest. What is that rest spoken of? It is a multi faceted rest it is when we come to the place of understanding that I can do nothing myself to please God or find his favor as when Jesus was on the cross and he declared it is, it is finished he ceased from his work and fulfilled all the righteous requirements of the law he then descended to the lower regions and took back the keys of Hades and death from the evil one. 
that death and judgment now pass us over through grace by faith. And this is very important to understand on this Passover weekend that death and judgment have passed us over. The reason why we are in the trance over Ecclesia and the word Ecclesia, for those of you who don't know, is the Greek word which is used for church and it literally means a celestial or a company or a company of celestial or um, beings that are not earthly, if you look at its full meaning. Uh, if this is bouncing around a bit, I'm sorry, I'll try and keep this stable so that it's not so far out there. And we are saved by faith. And the word saved, which is used throughout the New Testament, is the, it, there's two words for saved and salvation. It's so, soza and solaria. And the one means to be made whole, complete, and it, uh, that nothing further is to be done. In other words, it's a complete work. And if we are baptized into Christ through the resurrection, work of the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwelling in us, we are now seated with Christ in the heavenlies. And we are not on the earth place of being both in heaven and on earth. And this, a lot of people have battle with us to understand that you can be on earth and in heaven simultaneously but you are a multi-faceted being and in weeks to come we will be covering a lot more of understanding it from a quantum dimension as well as a spiritual dimension and how the spiritual and the quantum really are totally one there is no difference what the quantum scientists are now discovering the early church knew and understood that it's by faith that we see the particle. And it's by faith that when we look, it becomes a reality. And that there are multi facets to the realms of the heavenlies. I just want to share something else here. On, if we look at what faith is for a moment, I'm just giving you a very broad background here. Faith from Hebrews 11 verse 1, now faith is. What is faith? It is the substance and evidence of things not seen and things not yet experienced. Now, the Greek word faith is pistis, and it literally means an ascended understanding or revelatory knowledge of. You have different levels of faith and the level of faith that we are aspiring to is faith of the sun yes. which that require that is required to fully operate as sons of romans 8 verses 14. those who are led of the spirit of god are the sons of god the weos thesia mm. a weos a weos is a fully mature son who has been come to a full understanding and knowledge of his father's business and is about his father's business. And the father entrusts him with the seal of authority to be a representative of the father as if the father himself were present. Because you've got four words in the, in the original Quenonia Greek, which speaks of child or son. You have nepios, which means an infant or a babe. You have polion, which is a young child. Then you have technon, 
which is a young adult, which is, but he's not yet fey and able to be trusted with the father's authority. And then we have Weos, which is a fully mature son in whom the father can, um, who mother can send as if he himself were there and can entrust with a family seal of authority. And this is when it speaks of Jesus, the son of God, it uses the word Yash Yeshua Het Weos Ephesius, which is Jesus, the fully mature son of God. And Romans 8.14, when it speaks of those who are led by the Spirit of God, are the Weos Ephesia, it's those who are fully mature and can be entrusted by the Father to represent the Father as if the Father himself were present. Where the technon is one who is not yet trusted, for he will substitute his own ideas and own understanding instead of being a true representative or express image of the Father. And this is when we are entering into the realms of the heavenlies and becoming true sons of God. We are to hear what the Father says, see what the Father does, and express that on earth as in heaven. And the prime purpose of the next few weeks is to teach people how, how to activate and access the realms of heaven in order to hear and see from heaven. Now, one of the things I've always taught, and I want to share this briefly with you guys, when you enter into the realms of heaven, some people say, well, how do I enter into the realms of heaven? How do I get there? Use the word of God as a doorway or a gateway, because Jesus is the door to heaven through the Holy Spirit, found works very effectively um the word imagination is used a lot these days but i personally don't like using the word imagination all the time i prefer using the word of seeing it in your mind's eye picture yourself for instance at the well with the sumerian woman when jesus is standing there and Allow yourself to be part, sit on the conversation. Just picture this in your mind and use this as a doorway to access the heavens. And as they are chatting and he's speaking to her and telling her about the things in her life and she's recognizing who he is, allow yourself to enter into that conversation and allow yourself to to slowly in your mind's eye through the Holy Spirit to actually bring you to a place of conversing with Jesus and the woman in the well and hearing what they're saying and the other disciples and just allow the conversation to take place and pick up from there. And you'll start to recognize that you're hearing a whole different dimension. Now, a lot of people are scared and afraid of hearing from the devil or hearing from a different area, I say very simply, Jesus said, if you ask of my father, of your father in heaven, he will give you the Holy Spirit. You being evil, speaking to the Pharisees, if your son asks for a fish, will you give him a snake? Now, if we're asking our father in heaven for something, He's not going to give the devil the access to speak to us. But if you want to really test it, it's simple. Do yourself a favor. Keep yourself a journal. And write down whatever you get. And what you get, do the following test on it. Does it edify? Does it line up? with what you've seen previously in scripture or is it your normal general everyday thinking 
Because when you are inspired by the Spirit of God, it's from a higher dimension, a higher level of understanding. It won't be just the normal level you're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. The normal thinking you hear, it will be above that. Because the frequencies, as you start to tune into the frequencies of heaven, you start to hear on a higher level. And when it's the evil one or any negative evil dimensions of spiritual forces, you will pick it up in your spirit if you're born of the spirit of God. You will get that check in your spirit. I know when I first started doing this, I used to actually feel almost nauseous when it wasn't the right spirit. And from that, I started to engage and understand that as you start to use the door as a gateway, you can step in and step out of different dimensions of the heavenlies. And you start to see and experience things in a whole different way. Um, my first real, what I called an open vision, as a young kid, I used to see angels all the time, which was something quite normal to me. Then when I went through my teenage years, it sort of seemed to disappear. Then I hit a period where for seven years, I willfully turned my back on God until one night, going through total depression after spending several years um, experienced a bit of, bit of post-traumatic um, stress as a result of four years in the Angolan bush um, with the Angolan war. We sort of trying to get back to normality a few years after that. I sat on the beach one night and I said, if there's truly a God in heaven, show me what is real. And bang, the next thing, what, do I, what happens? I have of all these angels around me and the person of Yeshua, as he is described by John appears right in front of me with his eyes that are burning with glory that it looks like I'm looking into liquid fire of a blast furnace. And he says the following to me, he says, I and my father are one. In us is no shadow of turning. We are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Go and share my love with a hurting, dying world. And that was the key that God gave me, was everything we do has to be done in love. Because the frequency of heaven, the highest frequency of light, is God's love. And as a father who loves, we will, as we start to enter in and experience the heavenly dimensions, we're going to see a whole different facet from the religious order that has bound men and condemned them to hell when, it, when the Father has never condemned them to hell. And so many misinterpretations of hell have gone forth on the, on the, into the world that it's actually bad for the fact that, number one, the word hell, the only true word hell, fire, and the lake of fire was reserved for the fallen angels, never created or made for man. Hades, which often is translated as hell, is where Jesus went for three days and three nights in order to set free those that had been bound in Hades and to take back the keys of sin and death from Lucifer, the evil one at that time, in order that we no longer have to experience death, neither spiritually or physically, if you truly believe. Now, a lot of people for many years have said to me, oh, how can you say we don't have to experience death? Well, years and years and years ago, I used to make the statement, I am believing that I'm going to become like Job and then become like Enoch. No, first I will believe God as Job did, irrespective of everything that comes against me. And then I want to become a friend of God like Enoch did. 
and one day go for a walk and just cross over into the dimensions of the spirit that I no longer have to come back into the earthly realm. Now, that is, Enoch was the first case seen in scripture of a man transcending death. Then we see Ezekiel being caught up in the whirlwind. We see Moses experiencing that. A lot of people believe Moses died, but he was never buried. His body was resurrected. And he experienced the resurrection life before Jesus came and, re and rose from the grave. Moses was a type and a shadow of that which was. And Jesus, when he ascended, he took captivity captive. And the graves were opened and the dead in Christ, the old saints arose and those that had come to salvation while he lived on the earth were risen with him. And they formed the first cloud of witnesses. And those that have been dead in Christ since, I believe there have been several who have gone beyond life and death and been, become immortal. One of those is John. John, the disciple of Jesus. If anybody can tell me that you can put somebody in a vat of boiling, in a quadrant of boiling oil, and you don't kill somebody, that they have not become immortal and overcome death, then I'm going to say to you, show me that person that can be put in a vat or a quadra of boiling oil and not experience death, which happened to John in oil. And because they could not him, the Romans sent him to Patmos to be exiled. And that was on the island of Patmos, being in the spirit on the Lord's day, which is every day, he experienced what he wrote in the book of Revelation. Now, we don't know how much other things he wrote and experienced because that's all that was ever found of the ancient texts. And we must remember a lot of people say the Bible is the completed word of God. Now, I don't believe God ever stopped speaking. So the Bible isn't the completed word of God. It is part of the word of God. For Jesus is the living word. And when the living word is alive and living in us, and we are facing him in the heavenlies, he imparts fresh revelation and imparts word to us on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, before coming to an understanding of these revelations, for many years I operated under the anointing and office of an Ephesians 11 prophet hearing from the word of God. And this is where things started opening up. And this is purely tonight an intro into how to access heaven. And we're going to take you into whole dimensions. I, I believe God is wanting to bring the church to maturity. His ecclesia, his body, his bride, to the fullness of the maturity of the stature of Christ. I would just like to read the word from Ephesians 4, verses 1. We've often read and heard, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors, pastors and teachers. For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Most people stop right there. But the actual purpose of those five giftings that Jesus gave to the body, to the ecclesia, and to mankind is from verse 13 on. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, 
to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning, Christful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. That is the purpose of the Ephesians 4.11 giftings to the body, is to bring the ecclesia to maturity, to bring the church to the fullness of the stature of Christ no longer tossed about by every wind of doctrine, but hearing directly themselves from Jesus, from the Father, and from the Holy Spirit, by accessing the realms of heaven and transcending the realms of the natural into the heavenlies. And it's when you transcend that, you become one with Christ and one with the Father. John 17, prior to Jesus' um, death on the cross, in the garden, what does he pray? He says, Father, I pray that they will be one as we are one. I in them and you in me and we in them and them in us. That is the unity of the fullness of the stature of Christ. That we become one with God. And I love the word when it, when it speaks of in the book of Acts, where they were all in the upper room, and it says they were in one accord. And it wasn't a hundred accord, by the way. It was one accord. They were all in one accord. The word used there is homothea laid on, which means to be passionately the same in our love towards God. And with that, I'm going to open up for any questions. Anybody have any questions, anything they'd like to ask on that intro so far? I've kept it short, sweet, and to the point, but let us carry on from there. <laughs> this is good stuff, Dimitri. This is grand. Anybody who want to ask anything? Anybody want to share anything? And as I said, we're going to be doing like two weeks uh, just sharing with you what it's all about what, it, what it's about that you can understand the reality of living in the spirit because we're not called to be earthly beings we're not called to be tethered to the earth we're called to be heavenly beings operating on the earth and i i just love the fact that i am in christ i'm in that place of being in the spirit at the right hand of the Father. And when it speaks of being at the right hand of the Father, if anybody was at your right hand, it's the place of honor afforded to a dignitary. That's what being at the right hand of somebody means. It's being that place of honor. And we are at the right hand of the Father in that place of dignity in Christ. This is uh, Michelle Crow. I really appreciate your explanation. I think you did a great job. Thank you. Any, any questions you guys have, just please feel free to share. I'm seeing we, we predominantly are connecting with the U.S. at the moment. It looks like our South African fellowshipping people have had a problem connecting, but we're going to sort that out in this week coming anyway. Um, but I, I've really needed to, a lot of people, are, uh, when this goes out onto YouTube or whatever, we, uh, 
should help a lot of people as well with understanding what it means to be in Christ. And we will start to practically engage and teach on how to get into the spirit over the next few weeks and how to actually connect with the heavenly realms. Um, but people really had so much misunderstanding in the church for so many years on everybody's waiting to die to go to heaven. I never heard Jesus once mention to his disciples, you've got to die before you can go to heaven. He taught them to pray. He said, pray in this manner. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on earth as in heaven. And he taught his disciples to access heaven. In order for the kingdom to come on earth, you've got to be able to see what the Father's doing in heaven. In order to be a mature son, you have to be in the presence of your Father. When you said that, Dimitri, about um, him teaching the disciples to access that, what came to me was where in John where he says, um, I'm the door. Yes. If any man enters in through me, he can come in and go out and find pasture. And so he was basically revealing it right then and there. You can enter in through me the door and go in and out. And, and uh, I love the way Justin said that that was, that was Jesus' salvation message. <laughs> yes, it was. You can come and go through him. Come on. He says... Yeah, add, add in. Yeah, can I say something, Dimitri? I think um, I think uh, this is a question for you, but I think um, part was well, a question and also observation. I think part of the problem um, here in the Western churches is the fact that um, we predominantly have a pastoral or vicar or church leader system. That you know, one man or like your church leader does it for you, or church leader hears from God, or so. And we're not taught to be priests. You know, we're not taught to be that royal priest that we are. Yeah. This is a problem. This is, this is one of the things where I, when I, I, pastored, I have pastored churches in the past. And when, in 83, when I had that open vision and Jesus said, I've called you as a prophet unto the nations, go and share my love with the hurting, dying world. Um, the church immediately wanted to put me into the box of being a pastor or an evangelist. Mm. And I said to them, but God hasn't called me to either of those functions. He's called me to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Yeah. And that's been our problem. We, uh, the church with a pastoral system has always seen the vicar or the pastor or the um, priest in his function to stand there and bring God to the people instead of teaching the people to engage into God themselves, that they may function in their, both their priestly and prophet function as hearing from God and standing in on behalf of the, the people around them to God and helping until we all come to the maturity of the statue of Christ. If someone were to say, uh, aren't you doing new age, how would you respond to that question? Um, very simple. The, many years ago, um, I would say about 28 years ago, the one day I was sitting watching a magician doing some very interesting things. And I said, Lord, watch this. And the Holy Spirit just spoke to my heart and he said, the devil and the, and the new age and every other thing that is not in Christ, that is a counterfeit, is a counterfeit of that which is the truth. You do not counterfeit a $3 or a three pound note. You counterfeit 
as close to the exact real thing as what you can. You don't make a counterfeit that is miles away from what is truth. So when they say, is this not new age? I say to them, it is the new dimensions of the age of the sons of God being revealed on the earth, which Christ actually taught when he was on the earth, but it was suppressed by the religious controlling order for close on 1,500 years after Constantine made it an official religion. Does that answer your question, Michelle? Yes, it does. It's the new dimension of the new, what was the sentence you said? You, you see, Jesus said um, to us, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. No man comes to him lest the Spirit draw him. Now, the counterfeit, which is the those that are in the that do not Jesus as the redemptive purpose that he came for will be teaching something which is close to the, the absolute truth. But it, it has minor error in it. It might have one or two little flaws. But the truth is, in the church for years, we haven't been ta taught the whole full gospel of the kingdom of Christ. We've only been taught a partial gospel of salvation come to Jesus and be saved which is only the doorway to the life in the spirit so when people say to me oh you're getting into new age I say to them no I'm in the age of the sons of God being revealed which is the maturity of the church and just take them to the book of Romans take them to Romans 8 and show them Romans 8, verse uh, 14, and Ephesians from verse 14 to 19, which speaks to the sons of God, and then take them to, uh, to Ephesians 4, verse 11 through to the one that I read, which is until we all come to the fullness of the stature of Christ. And that's the key. We've got to all come to the fullness of the stature of Christ, to the mature man, no longer tossed about by every wind of doctrine, hearing directly from God ourselves. Any other questions out there? Does that answer your question better, Michelle? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Anybody else out there want to share anything? Anything else you have that you'd like to just add to what we what I've been saying? Please feel free, please feel welcome, because we're not on a hierarchy here. We're all co-heirs with Christ. Well, I just wanted to add to what you were saying, uh, Dimitri, um, in that I've been called a lot of things. <laughs> um, and... Um, I just tell them that the enemy has always done what you just said, uh, counter, the counterfeit of what God does. And even, um, you know, Satan worshipers, their church rituals, like they mimic the Catholic church, the Satan worshipers and stuff. And then like the new agers, exactly, you know, because they're just mim mimicking what we should be doing they've found out the truth somehow and they're applying it and it works for them even though it's not the right way they didn't enter in through the right gate but through the right door but they are doing what we should have been doing and jesus did all that jesus did all that as a son on earth you know when he walked through the crowd and he disappeared through the crowd and then when he disappeared uh, or he appeared with the disciples, you know, and um, so 
it's not really hard to tell them that you know and and the bible throughout the whole bible that's all we that's all it's ever been showing us all the men of god who you know ezekiel and all these experiences that they were having supernatural you know uh they were translating you know <laughs> and um yeah. the enemy's translating and we should be translating you know and so yes we have been failed to be taught these things in the past but i'm 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 grateful now that we're in a time where we're being taught the truth we're we're being matured we're, we need to be matured, you know, and so praise God. I also so. want to add to that, um, Cindy uh, and Dimitri, I just wanted to add to that just how, um, you know, to the new age, they recognize and can see uh, the Christ in us. I mean, they can see the auras uh, of, of the presence of the Lord and often have commented. Um, um, and also the thing is that, there's a there's a witness also in them of what is genuine and what is not because the spirit that is within them is from the lord you know that they're they're born um into the earth and their spirit it comes from father into the earth at the time of their conception so there's a testimony of the of the spirit of each person of the truth and I've found when, when connecting with and having any relationship with those that are in New Age or involved in it in any way, that there's always been the testimony to say, wow, you've already gone into something I haven't had. And, and what I'm saying about that is that while there's a, a measure of things that they are actually sort of recognizing and seeing the point is that they don't know him the true and living God. They're getting their source from, they're getting um, Satan's false um, uh, trading uh, and the way he's trading his truth, what he got from the Father. They, they're getting that and they're having moments of these kinds of feelings and so on. Um, and they're getting recognition of creation and things about how to honor creation and things like that. But, but, Whenever I've engaged them in any way and said, well, would you like to just talk to the Lord about something? Um, immediately, uh, I mean, I've done it once before with the guy who was into the peace, uh, the, the peace um, doctrine, you know, um, Sung Young Moon. And um, after a long conversation, spontaneous thing that happened, I was about to leave and I said, well, would you like us just to pray? And and I just opened my mouth and said, thank you for your peace. And he stood there and the peace of God just enveloped him. And so at that moment in time afterwards, he said, what is it that you've got? You know, <laughs> and so I found that to be the case. So don't ever be afraid of, you know, talking to someone who's in a new age, because really they, they, there's a witness there that what they've got is not really the, the deal. Yeah, no, uh, you're spot on there, Michelle. I've experienced that myself on several occasions. I know when I was in my teenage years, I used to have more meaningful conversations with new ages about the Christ life than I did with many of the pastors at the time. Um, I was 13, 14 years old when I wanted to walk across a swimming, a swimming pool, and the new ages encouraged me, but the the Christians were saying, you can't do that. You're not Jesus. And people were, and when I went to the age of 17, raised my brother from the dead who had been shot. The pastors told me that was for the early church. We had to turn my back for how many years on God until I ended up where the people I encountered that encouraged me in that were often not the religious order of the day, but those who were seeking in the new age, but had not yet discovered it was a counterfeit. Yeah. 
there's anything else that anybody wants to share? Otherwise, we can stop the recording and we can just have an open chat. Just before we stop the recording, I would say that we, over the next few weeks, we are going to also start helping you to engage and to actually share with you how to engage in the heavenlies and how to take things into the heavenlies and how to connect with the different realms through Jesus, the door, uh, who is the salvation. We're going to teach you how to step in and out. If you've never come to Christ before, we're not going to teach you how to go via the sinner's prayer. We're going to teach you how to step in through the doorway, which is Christ. Jesus said, I am the door. And the Holy Spirit's going to lead you to that door. And we're going to show you how to step through that door, which is Jesus. Uh, and how to access the Father and the throne of grace through that door. Can I just say one more thing, Dimitri, just came to my mind about just uh, coming back to the, the new age. We, we need to keep in mind that what the new age believes is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They believe in yeah. good and evil. So they don't have a reference or, or they don't have a way to just live in the tree of life. Because, yes. because they, they, you see what I'm saying? So they're in the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but, but they don't have a way to just live in the tree of life. They, they, they don't know how to deal with the evil. So they believe yes. that it's part of them. And that that it's comes from not having, not, not having yet understood what it means to rest in Christ. And I would like, want to take that a bit further sometimes, is that learning to rest. It's through the resting. When Jesus said it is finished, it was finished. He then entered into the fullness of the rest of the Father. Where, if we just look at that, I want to just give you the scripture reference to read there. It's Hebrews 4. Read the whole of Hebrews 4 from verse 1 straight through, but specifically verses 1 to 6. You'll see that there was a rest that God gave us is what Jesus entered into. And we have to enter into that rest with him. And it's when we enter that rest, we live in the tree of life, no longer in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yes, and that's the difference because they don't have freedom from evil because they don't know Jesus, what Jesus did. And that had the function of Jesus. They don't really understand. They think he's a teacher, whatever, but they don't really believe that he actually dealt with evil. Anyway. Yeah. And when he took back the keys of Hades and sin and death, he dealt with evil. It was done. And for that purpose, the Son of God was manifest to destroy the works of the evil one. And he made a public, public spectacle of the powers and principalities, triumphing over them. And it's from that place into the rest. I think we can. Cut the recording for the evening if you like.